Welcome to the Community Virtual Library. Um, as John said, I'm Dr. Valerie Hill. I have been researching virtual environments for 15 years with a focus on changing literacy. As the information revolution turned literacy and our life upside down. So I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library where we're all gathered here today in Second Life. And this is a real library in a virtual world. And this library is overseen by real librarians and information professionals. And you can see I'm standing right here to my left is our CVL, Community Virtual Library, reference desk where real librarians can serve virtual world communities. You'll also see a chat bot called John Librarian, who is there often if there's no physical world librarian on duty. So look around you. Many of the objects that you see here in this library, such as books, an old card catalog, signs, and, and many more of the objects are all interactive. You can click on things and uh, see what kind of information you, you can get. And you'll find um, our calendar, the times when librarians are on duty. We have librarians from around the globe who work here. And all different resources that we provide on our website. It's here in the local chat, communityvirtuallibrary.org. So I've taught at all grade levels, um, from kindergarten up through uh, college age. I've served as a school librarian for 20 years, and then I was a college professor of information science. Um, so I'm familiar with the needs of all ages of learners. I'd like you to walk inside our reading room. So I'm going to walk right through the crowd here. The reading room is right through these arches. Come in here and just browse around a traditional looking library room. And you might think, why would you create a traditional looking library when in a virtual world you can make it look like anything? We could be standing in swirling rainbows up in the clouds and be talking about literacy. We wouldn't have to be in a traditional looking library. But this is a tip of the hat to the past to our rich history of the traditional physical libraries of old. And as I'm going along explaining metamodernism, I think you'll come to see that metamodernism, or post-postmodernism, as some call it, strives to balance the rich past history of civilization with the innovation that is rapidly expounding all around us. That's metamodernism and oscillation. Um, and so we, we, we wanted this library to sort of be a tip of the hat to the old libraries of the past. All of these books, you can click on them and they will take you to either the Gutenberg Project or there's lots of different resources we have here, of course, striving to be um, abiding by copyright law. So this is our, our main library, um, and as I said, it, we could have made it anything, a fantasy world, um, but we, because anything is possible in a virtual world. But the purpose here is that balance. So libraries and literacy have changed. And changing literacy impacts all of us. Each one of you here are impacted by what I'm going to talk about today. That's my focus today changing literacy, and that it has become my passion um, within my research. So we're going to walk outside in just a moment to the front of the library. Meta literacy for digital citizens. There's now a need for a new look at literacy. And I've come to embrace the term meta literacy, which I'm going to explain a bit about today and see what you think about the term meta literacy. It's a new term, and it's a term for literacy in digital culture because we can all communicate with many digital tools all over the world. In fact, we are right now. Many of you right now are in Turkey, many of you are in Ireland. Um, and here I am in the United States, and we're all live interacting uh, with new media. Here's the meta-literacy Turkish definition for those of you who might want that. 
literacy in digital culture require, requires juggling formats, both physical and digital. We're all now required to become good digital citizens because most of our communication and most of our intake of information is in digital formats. I believe more and more people are becoming familiar with the term digital citizenship and many schools are now embedding digital citizenship lessons right in their, um, their curriculum. You can see I've moved over to my next slide. Alvin Toffler, he's a well-known futurist. He coined a term, and the term is prosumer. And he coined this term because he saw that individuals were beginning to both create and share content themselves. And so we are all now prosumers because we're both producers and consumers of content. And many people call it user-generated content that we're able to upload online and share with others. So during my career as a librarian, this was happening so quickly, particularly right at the turn of the century, right around 2000, 2001, the information hierarchy toppled right during my career as a librarian. What a fascinating time that was. Because now we have more user-generated content by far than we have traditional media formats, such as printed books. In fact, YouTube has become the number one source of information on the planet. If you want to learn how to do something like change a leaky pipe or learn how to crochet or knit or embroidery, just about anything, you can find a YouTube video that will help you. So we are both consumers and producers of media. And you put those two words together and you see that you are a prosumer. With all this user-generated content being uploaded every single moment of the day, we are bombarded by information constantly. And this is a huge challenge to literacy. The volume of information that we have to sort through every single day. And this illustrates the need to rethink the term literacy. I'd like to ask how many of you upload content online. So think about that. And if you do upload content online and post it, um, type the platform that you most likely would be posting content to, such as Facebook, YouTube, a blog, Twitter, Twitch, Discord, TikTok. Uh, there are other apps and sites that you may be posting and interacting and sharing content. So if you'd like to type maybe one that you primarily use quite often, you can type that. And there are many that I didn't mention. I'm seeing Reddit come up. Yes. And uh, so all of these are part of meta literacy being able to interact with a huge audience in real time. And this is something that has really changed literacy. I'll jump over to my next slide. There's a little bit more here about Alvin Toffler, the futurist who sort of predicted some of these changes that, that we have seen happening rapidly. Alvin Toffler has a famous quote, which I really like. It re relates to changing literacy. He says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. You have to think about that for a minute. It used to be that literacy meant reading and writing. And if you could read and write, you were literate. That is no longer the case because these apps we just talked about, Discord, Reddit, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, on and on, the apps are constantly changing. And the operating systems that we use on our devices are constantly updating, upgrading, and, and changing. I work with elderly people often, and I find that this constant change 
is a huge challenge for them because in the past, people grew up learning in a different way. They learned with reading and writing as the top form of literacy. It was linear. Once you learned something, you mastered it, but that's no longer the case. Now you must remaster it, take it apart, learn it again. There's a new app for that. And so this constant oscillation, there's a swinging between production and consumption of media, a swinging between physical and digital formats. This swinging back and forth between learning and unlearning and changing, this aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call metamodernism. I didn't make up that term, but I follow quite a few um, professors of philosophy who are adopting the term metamodernism as a term that identifies our philosophical moment in time right now. Of course, you can't really name a historical moment when you're in it. We'll have to see what we finally end up calling it. Um, many people are calling it other terms, but it's the term that follows postmodernism. I'll put the Turkish definition of metamodernism here in the local chat. And as I said, time will tell whether or not this is the term that is adopted as our philosophical moment in time. Some people are calling it post-post-postmodernism, but putting that extra post in there to me sounds a bit redundant. Um, acquiring knowledge in the past meant that we were climbing this ladder toward final mastery. Not anymore. In metamodern culture, as we learn these new tools and apps that are constantly uh, changing and we're evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software updates, there's simply no end to the incoming stream of information. That's metamodernism. And that's why we need meta literacy. And I'll put a link to my book that <clears throat> John O'Connor mentioned earlier in the introduction, Meta Modernism and Changing Literacy, here in the local chat. This addresses the challenges that we're facing today due to all these rapid changes. I believe it's imperative that we each understand our own personal responsibility as digital citizens. I'm going to jump over to my meta literacy slide. Else, you can see what is what is literacy now in digital culture. Well, I've introduced you to this term that I feel fits with your personal responsibility at any age, and I mean from young young children to the elderly. Everyone needs to understand meta literacy. The two people that came up with this term, Tom Mackey and Trudy Jacobson, in 2014 they coined this term to help us better understand how, can we, how we can be literate now in digital culture as prosumers. Now, this is essential to digital citizenship. You can find more about metaliteracy on the website metaliteracy.org. Um, I shared a, a guest blog po post on that, um, on that blog. I'll put the link there if you're interested in hearing a little more about my take on meta-literacy, particularly in virtual environments. But if you zoom in on the circle here on the slide where I'm sitting, you can see that meta-literacy really has a lot of different aspects because we play many roles as a meta-literate learner as both a consumer and a producer of content. You can see that as a learner and producer, we can be a participant, a communicator, a translator, an author, a teacher. We all teach each other, peer learning, a collaborator, a producer, a publisher, a researcher. All of these many roles are part of meta-literacy. And we do that through metacognition, cognition, both effective and behavioral um, aspects. So there's a lot to meta literacy I'm not going to go into, but you can go to their website if you're interested in the way we think about our learning. And you probably have heard of metacognition, which means thinking 
about our thinking? Well, the internet has connected all of us and it's given everyone a voice. Yet, there's a problem with that. Not everyone has something meaningful to add to the conversation. The internet has become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without metaliteracy, whether you call it that or not. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and to be participants in digital culture, well, unless you're a hermit high up in the mountains somewhere with no internet connection at all, we are all prosumers and participants, we understand and become aware of the need for digital citizenship. And then we can learn to be an ethical contributor and an ethical participant. I'll jump over here to the color wheel. As I said, everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good or meaningful or even true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson believe that we live in a post-truth world. You might want to jot that little phrase down, post-truth. The many elements of digital citizenship, well, that's really beyond the scope of this short talk. I'm just giving you a brief overview of, of digital citizenship with a meta-literacy focus. But the many elements of digital citizenship co cover ethical use of information, cybersecurity and safety, com communication online, privacy, and even emotional intelligence. So I'm sitting on top of the wheel, the, this digital citizenship wheel that comes from the DQ Institute. But digital citizenship, it has become essential for all of us at all ages. And I have a question for you to consider, and you might want to uh, answer this in local chat. Think about this. When I was a school librarian, and this is a few years back, I asked the parents at a, at a school meeting, I said, parents, at what age do you think your child becomes a digital citizen? Well, some, someone said, oh, probably around nine or 10 years old. But actually, it is often younger than that. Very young children use digital devices every day. Some of you have probably seen little toddlers on a digital device. And many parents upload a sonogram of their unborn baby on social media. Think about that. Digital citizenship can begin before birth. Think about the children that you know, the young children, maybe brothers or sisters, neighbors or, or friends. Do you think that they need to know how to be safe online? Yes, I have, I have a, a little grandson who is four and he knows how to do quite a bit on a digital device just intuitively because so many of our devices are built to just be so easily adapted by the human hand and by the way that we think. And I want to also ask uh, if you have any concerns about very young children and digital citizenship. Uh, there, it's something really that we all need to think about, perhaps on social media or elsewhere online, on the many apps and games that are available many of them so-called educational apps that are not really created with anyone who has an educational background. That's something to consider too. Bad Goblin is, is saying, I believe we should be completely anonymous. Oh, I love that phrase because this is a meta-modern problem. For me, I am online only for the reason of my of educational purposes. I don't really care for personal social media sharing. And so I'm completely transparent and not anonymous, but I totally understand Bad Goblin's point. If we were completely anonymous, privacy would not be such a huge problem. So which should we be? Open and authentic and transparent or completely anonymous? It's a metamodern conundrum. <laughs> and what about teenagers? There are, there's a lot of research coming out about the problems with teenagers and self-esteem and the constant addiction to their social media. 
I've heard some teenagers sleep with their cell phone right beside them. It's almost become an appendage to their hand and perhaps they have become cyborgs. <laughs> if you look up the de definition, yes, most of us have become cyborgs. Bad Goblin also says, uh, the places where children access the internet must be under family control until a certain age. So important for parents to understand where their children are, what kind of information they, and what kind of individuals they are interacting with. Of course, it takes the parents some time to look into that and make sure that that's, they're setting all of those limits. You can see on this wheel, there's many aspects of digital citizenship that I'm not going into today, um, but we'll touch on them because they all interrelate with literacy. Have any of you encountered oversharing on social media, where you found information that really was nobody's business that you didn't really want to hear about or see, or cyberbullying, which is another problem with young people and their self-esteem. Of course, we've always had bullies, but it's a whole different thing when you're bullied online and it's public and, and um, all, everyone sees the things that are said about you and very young people who are forming their identity find this very challenging. It, it's led to severe consequences. And yes, um, Johanna says a lot of stuff goes under the radar. That's true. There's a lot that we don't, that's not apparent to us. And from the sheer volume, no one can keep up with all of the social media anyway. But there's also, with cybersecurity, under the radar, we have the dark web. I have a chapter in my book all about the dark side of digital culture. And um, I am not a cybersecurity expert, but I do have colleagues here in the virtual world who know much more about cybersecurity and have done presentations on it. It's something that we all do need to be aware of. Sarah mentions, it depends on what's considered oversharing. Absolutely. Some people might think just telling some of your personal life what's going on is oversharing, where others might think it depends on the content of it and the, the type of images you're sharing. That's emotional intelligence. When you understand your audience and what needs to be shared and what is uh, inappropriate for that audience. And one problem is on social media, there's a blurry line between personal, private, and professional public. And that line sometimes is so blurred that there's really no difference. And that's what's become a real problem. That happened before people understood best practices for social media. So I'm going to pull out a little example uh, that might help you think about digital citizenship and using um, the appropriate content that we've talked about. I'm going to pull out my flag here and just put it in front of me. This is the think before you post flag. <laughs> and I'm going to drop all of you a copy of it so you'll all be able to take away today a think before you post flag. Think, T-H-I-N-K. You can see what each letter stands for. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? If you think about those questions, and if young people would think about those questions first, that might lead to less oversharing, less cyberbullying, and less shouting out meaningless nonsense that clutters our daily intake of information. So we talked about teenagers. Have any of you encountered um, any of the cyberbullying bullying that I talked about? Or the problem of teens developing low self-esteem that can happen when they compare their lives. My daughter told me that several years back about the problem she was seeing on Instagram, especially with young girls who use filters to make all of their pictures so pretty. And it becomes a competition of who has the prettiest life. And, and that just adds to the burden of trying to find your identity in life. Um, and it, it, it's, I've seen sometimes kids spending more time editing their life than actually living their life. And, that, and I find that really um, troubling, if not sad or frightening. Even the elderly need to know about 
cybersecurity and oversharing. Um, they sometimes run into scams and are easy targets if they don't understand, you know, how how professional a, a, a scam can look, a phishing scam. So um, all ages, from tiny tots through the elderly, need to understand meta literacy. And as I said, for the elderly, scamming, privacy issues, those are quite a big problem. So it really concerns all of us, no matter what um, general, generational age group you, uh, you belong to. And I'm going to jump over to my next slide. Meta literacy in meta modern culture requires balance. And balance is a key word in meta modernism as we oscillate among opposite concepts. I mentioned I was a school librarian for 20 years, and during that time, I witnessed the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. Now, in the physical world, I'm holding my two hands up like two parentheses, and inside those two parentheses is Gutenberg. <laughs> the Gutenberg parentheses have closed. The Gutenberg Press came out around 500 years ago, in early you know, 1500, and around the turn of the century, 500 years later, the Gutenberg parentheses closed because print, the book, is no longer king of the information hierarchy. That, that parenthetical moment in time for 500 years, print was king. Print, books, everyone read in read books and things in, in print. And now print is no longer king. Um, so uh, the, the, those parentheses have closed. Um, I do see someone has uh, mentioned uh, some of the problems we talked about, all different age groups needing meta literacy. Bad Goblin says that he saw someone in a con computer group on Facebook spelled it wrong, and then everyone insulted him and went after him, and it made Bad Goblin feel bad. Insulting like that, and and that kind of speaks to grammar too, and how on in digital culture it is so fast that typos, grammatical errors have they've become acceptable because there's often not a lot of time for re revision, and we need to respect that and not point out people's mistakes in a rude way and insult them, but realize there are times when we must use good grammar and revise, and there are times when we have to just let that go. It's just too fast. So excellent example of how literacy has changed. Emojis, typos, those, those are fast ways to communicate that we didn't have prior to the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. Now that the Gutenberg parentheses have closed, fixed print media like books, they were fixed, they were set in stone, like, like the stone, like uh, stone carvings, the first literacy. Well, now that's giving way to fluid media. It's not fixed, it's fluid. And there's no more printed encyclopedias. The last one I had was from about the year 2000, the turn of the century, and I would bring the fourth graders over and let them hold these encyclopedias in their hand and turn the pages. And I told them, you, you won't find these in the future. You know, this, and dictionaries, printed dictionaries. We still have some, but most people do not use them. It's much faster to just look it up on your smartphone. But uh, there are very few dictionaries or print encyclopedias. Most things now are born digital. And um, digital content is changeable. Ebooks are changeable. They're owned by proprietary you know, companies. And new editions come out. It's fluid. Blogs are fluid. Everything that's in digital format is fluid and changeable, where a book is not. But how many of you still enjoy reading a book in print? I love print books, of course, as a librarian, and I believe they will most likely always be around. There are some uh, huge advantages to books in print. When you own a book in print, it's a physical thing that you can take anywhere. It doesn't matter if your e-reader suddenly becomes out of date, you know, um, you still have your book and it's, it's yours and you can read it anywhere you go. Uh, but there are advantages also to digital formats. And 
Many of us use ebooks, of course, websites, databases, re videos, podcasts, blogs, and a million apps. We all juggle all of these tools, sometimes simultaneously. Some of you right now may have this window open. There's often other devices around us. Many people I know have two screens up at all times. We juggle a lot of digital content, sometimes simultaneously, and that's actually changing the human brain. I have a, a chapter on uh, how the, the human brain is changing and being impacted by the internet and how that, that changes literacy uh, in my book. So this juggling that we're doing and this balancing act, it's a meta-literacy skill and that it's part of digital citizenship. It's so easy to just get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool <clears throat> just whirling around us. It's a never-ending stream. And have you ever felt this, um, this little tug, like say you're waiting in a doctor's office or for an appointment or you're sitting in the bus. I've looked around on a city bus and every single person was staring into their phone. There's, there's no downtime to look out the window and just think, contemplate, watch nature, we're, we're compelled to pick up that device because there's the endless stream of information beckoning us. Have any of you noticed that or felt, you know, that it's interesting? I think um, the word boredom is a word that has changed. Young people, if they feel a little antsy, like there's nothing happening, what do they do? They reach for their phone. Boredom may be a word that is no longer relevant. Um, and I think this part of this is the dark side of digital culture because it is changing us as humans. And there is a dark side to that. And I think digital citizenship helps us become aware of maybe sometimes taking a break, maybe sometimes reflecting on things and just giving ourselves a breath. As we, as we balance all of these tools. So not only must we learn to juggle and choose the best tools, but we also have to juggle between worlds, physical, virtual, and augmented. Here we are talking about all these tools inside a virtual platform. It's a bit ironic. <laughs> Choosing the best space for a specific purpose, working, or gaming, social interaction, or learning. Where's the best virtual space and what are the best virtual tools for each job at hand? That too is a meta literacy skill. And this balancing act, this balancing act has actually become a personal responsibility. Sure, your teachers can help um, figure out where you're going to go to learn, but you as a person, have to figure out where you're going to live with these digital tools around you 24 seven. And that's what really young people now have to understand. New platforms are emerging constantly with virtual reality headsets. Um, and by the way, do any of you have a virtual reality headset? Because we're in a virtual world and I consider this virtual reality because um, virtual reality is a reality, a simulated reality and we're in a simulated reality. We're just not on a headset. Um, I have a, a VR headset, and I've been in many, many VR platforms. None to date have I found as high quality as where we're standing right now for actual learning and interacting with each other. But um, they are emerging, and there's a lot of hype about VR. There's also 360-degree videos that are becoming mainstream. And all of this relates to meta-literacy. And indeed, it is a balancing act. I'm going to jump over to metamodernism and sit on my metamodernism slide. There's a spiral. And, you know, all of life is built on spirals. Nature has a plethora of spirals within plants and animals and even our DNA. <laughs> it's a spiral. Life is a spiral. Learning is a spiral. The seasons are a spiral. And as you go around and around, it's you go back again each time through each season, spring, summer, fall, and winter. But each time you go around, it's new. 
that's really what metamodernism is like. It's spiraling and swinging around and around, but yet taking the past, building on it, and bringing in the new. So the information revolution changed literacy forever, and we live in a fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what it's called. But I told you I adopted the term metamodernism in discussion of our current philosophical era, even though there are other names for it in the running, like post-postmodernism. I present the topic today here in the metaverse, and that's a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality. So think about that. We're standing right here inside a metaphor of our world. And as you think about that, you are using metacognition because you're thinking about your thinking. About, about, about. <laughs> meta, meta, meta. Are we overusing this term meta? I don't think so because it's the only way to describe what we're talking about. Meta being the prefix of about, beyond. When we're talking about these concepts that are a whole new way of thinking about it, meta is the perfect prefix, prefix for that, I believe. And I'm gonna sit here on this slide that tells a little bit about our philosophical moment of metamodernism. If you scroll in, into this slide, you can see that I chose just a few examples of um, art through the past century to show you that uh, metamodernism is not just about literacy, it's about everything in our philosophical time. So um, I believe we've become metamodern, and it's certainly time to become metaliterate. Metamodernism includes the way we express ourselves in our cultural era. And that can be through art, literature, music, um, and architecture. I recently read a blog, blog post talking about David Bowie's mu music and how he really was moving toward metamodernism. Um, and um, also through architecture. And you'll, you'll see in my book I give examples of, of all of these um, different uh, artistic styles from modernism to postmodernism to metamodernism. In, during postmodernism, we, we heard a lot about tearing down grand narratives and you know, it, all the stories that we thought you know, were so true, tearing them apart. And it brought a lot of dystopian fiction into my library that became very popular. A lot of books about zombies. Nothing wrong with that. Some of them were actually quite good. Um, Metamodernism is ushering in a new age that balances not just irony, but balances irony with sincerity. An age which balances a respect for tradition alongside the excitement of innovation that I mentioned earlier. And you can see in the early 1900s, we had modernism. Ezra Pound with his saying of make it new, make it new, things were changing quickly. And then in the mid to, to late uh, 1900s, um, we had postmodernism. And then around the turn of the century, we moved into metamodernism, but those dates are not set in stone. I mentioned that my book looks at our philosophical eras of the past, stressing the importance of learning our history. If we don't preserve our history, it, it is not going to work out well. Our history, we can learn from it and move on. Of course, it's impossible to fully understand or name the era that we're living in, but um, <clears throat> Metamodernism is uh, a term that many people are beginning to use. I'm going to jump over on the slide that talks about learning environments because here we are inside a virtual learning environment. And learning environments have changed so much. Some of them changed rapidly during my um, time as an educator. Being in a virtual environment like you are right now, you have a meta-literacy skill. That's meta-literacy, learning how to function with all of these digital tools. So zoom in on this slide and you can kind of see how digital culture changed learning environments. You can see on the top left, the traditional rows of desks that we had. 
in modern culture back you know a, a good while back the traditional rows of desks and chalkboards and that has evolved into virtual spaces augmented reality apps like the one on the bottom left and also into vr i've been to many educators in vr meetings many of those environments are not really ready for learning but educators are exploring them and we're in a vr platform right now The pandemic has forced many people to use new tools quickly that they really were not comfortable with. And that really wasn't easy for a lot of students and educators. Now you may be comfortable utilizing many digital tools and many simultaneous applications, but I think we realize it is impossible to use them all. It's impossible to master all the different tools that are out there. You've, you've got this app that you use all the time. It's great. And then suddenly everybody says, oh, we're going to move over to this platform. We're going to use Slack now. Or we're all going to do our project management on Trello. Or we've got a whole new user platform that we're going to use. And all of a sudden, you have to completely relearn, as Alvin Toffler would say, learn, unlearn, and relearn, and move to yet another app or another platform. That's meta literacy for sure. And the, it's not going to stop because um, certainly there are a lot of problems that we're beginning to understand with big data companies. And changes may benefit us and help us to solve some of those privacy issues that we're all struggling with. The incredible volume of apps and information online can actually be overwhelming. And there's that acronym FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. Anybody know what that means? FOMO. It's another way to feel about just too much information coming at you. Yes, Johanna, fear of missing out. It's this little feeling you get that there's something happening and you're missing out on it, so you better reach for your phone you know, and scroll because you have FOMO. Well, too much information is coming at us, and too much information is just as big a problem as too little information. Think about prior to the Gutenberg Press, and think about the Dark Ages when people had little access to any information. It was just a horrible way to live with no information and no communication. But too much information can be as big, big a problem as too little. And some futurists predict if we don't solve some of the problems ahead of us, there could be a digital dark ages. And I'm going to jump to the next slide in a minute and give you just a little hint about what that means. Uh, <clears throat> so yes, it can be a problem. We're drowning in information. And we need to learn how to navigate through it. And then, of course, in addition to too much information, we've already mentioned the problem of privacy. Big data companies have mined our personal data. Some people say privacy is dead. I've actually been saying that for quite some time. I, I really think Google sometimes knows more about me than I know about myself. I didn't know that I would like that particular pair of boots, but they've been watching my shopping for years. <laughs> and it's like all of the different things that we put out there that are shared with big data companies really analyzes more about us than we possibly could imagine. So remember, I, I mentioned the dark side of digital culture. We do have tremendous obst obstacles that we have to overcome in digital culture, and they relate to, to meta literacy, privacy, cybersecurity, and confirmation bias. Let's see if you've heard of confirmation bias. That's when you tend to follow and friend people who agree with you, people who think like you do. You want to curate a community and a dashboard of incoming information that you agree with. But that's not how we learn. We don't learn by talking with, with people who agree with us. We learn in combat with others who oppose our ideas. And we have a discourse. We have a debate. And we respect each other and don't take it personally. But that's how we learn. And um, we're becoming um, a society that may lose the art of debate because we only want to talk with people who agree with us. 
I find that a gigantic problem. And it's called confirmation bias. We're biased because we only want to you know, follow people who confirm our ideas. But I remain hopeful. I can talk about the dark side of society and the dark side of you know, digital culture and all the obstacles we have to face. But I remain hopeful that these obstacles can be seen as opportunities if we truly become aware of them. And I think some of the younger generation are becoming aware of them. And like the documentary that's out now, The Social Dilemma, people see these problems. They're just not exactly sure how to get away from social media. Jaron Lanier's book, 10 Arguments for De Deleting Your Social Media, great book. But how do we do it? When every, that's where everyone is, is on social media. So um, we really have to think about that. And Olive Tree is saying, I prefer, prefer a conversation, a dialogue as a preference, not very keen on, on, uh, on debates. A conversation, um, Sherry Turkle has a great book called Reclaiming Conversation, because she talks about in that book that young people, particularly teens, they don't have conversations. They even text each other when they're in the backseat of the car. You know, they don't like to talk out loud. And so that's, that's a whole other thing to talk about, too. But it does certainly relate to meta-literacy. Oh, I just love this next topic over here. <laughs> but, and I just, it might be something that you're familiar with, but maybe you haven't given it as much thought as, as I've done here recently. Um, let's stand up and sit back down over here. Preservation of digital formats. This is a huge concern that's actually important to you, if you think about this. It's important to you. Um, now, I'm not going to go into it in detail because I could talk on this preservation topic for hours, but look at the photo here. The ancient Dead Sea Scrolls are there, an old cassette tape, some VHS tapes, and some old floppy disks that probably were out before some of you were even born. And some people had content on some of these old formats. And they either broke, or they, uh, they just aged and wore out, or they no longer have a device that can read them, and they no longer can find hardware that could possibly read them, and that data is lost forever. Gone. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they are ancient. We dug them up, and we can still read them. Physical formats do have that advantage. If we can salvage them, we can still understand them. Digital formats. When they're gone, they're gone. You can never get them back. And most of our content now is born digital. The archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, says this is what keeps him up at night. If we don't figure out how to migrate our digital formats as, as they evolve, we're lost. Right now, I mean, an example for you is MP3s. They're the current you know, top format for music. MP4 top format for sharing your videos. But that will change. And the hardware that we use to watch and listen, that will change. And those are just two formats. There are hundreds of formats out there that are changing and evolving. And I'll just mention too, when I was a little girl, I remember opening a big black photo album. And inside that photo album was a picture of my great grandmother dressed in clothes from long, long ago, and I was fascinated. People don't have photo albums. All of our photos are up in the cloud. If we don't figure out how to, and some people are really good at this, and they're organizing albums, and they're printing out some photos, and even making cool printed books of their photos. But some people don't have time to do that, and they're just all in the cloud. How are how's that going to affect the next generation? Are they going to even see the pictures of their great, great grandmother? Or are they going to be too busy taking their own selfie and editing it? Who knows? But thinking about preservation of literacy formats, it's a concern at the national level, at the global level, and at the personal level for you personally to think about are you, what content are you creating and where is it? And is it archived. And even in virtual worlds, as these formats change, um, how do we archive this journey that we're on? We like to record machinima, share some of the great things that have been accomplished in virtual worlds, but um, archival has become a huge challenge for everyone. It's also, as I said, a personal metaliteracy skill, because today most content is born digital.
So I'm going to ask you, do any of you have physical photo albums or do you organize your uh, photos um, on your digital devices or with music? My daughter-in-law is a jazz musician and she struggles so much because she loved CDs. She has her jazz CDs. And now that everything has gone digital, she can't find her music half the time. It's like, where is it? What device is it on? It's, you know, it's, it's just changing so quickly. And this also leads to digital legacy. Has anyone heard of that term? Digital legacy is, is asking the question, what happens to your content after you die? When you pass away, and there's been some educators in Second Life who had some amazing content, and when they passed away, nobody knew how to get it because, you know, the, the passwords and all the, um, you know, everything belonged to that particular avatar. And so even on social media, Facebook and other social media companies are coming up with digital legacy policies and procedures. In fact, there's a whole... There's a whole um, area and profession developing around digital legacy tools since most content is born digital. Now today, um, there's two terms you may not have heard of until today, and I hope you will take both of them away mentally to just consider or to bring into your own vocabulary should you choose to. And those two terms that I hope you're going to take away are metamodernism, which is our cultural moment, and metaliteracy, which is simply a term to address literacy today as prosumers. This is my research area, and I know future research is needed on everything that I've talked about today for all age groups to understand digital citizenship, from little tiny children that are just learning how to walk and talk to the elderly.